boundary of the polygon, the, the real line, I'm guessing? Yeah, the, the real line is, is the interior. Yeah, the, um, the upper half plane is mapped to the interior of the polygon with the real line corresponding to the boundary. Although the correspondence of boundaries in, uh, in complex analysis is a bit more complicated. So at the present, I prefer to avoid it. Okay? Okay, thanks. Okay, now, every straight line in the plane is of course a great circle on the sphere. This gave Hermann Schwartz the idea that it might be possible to generalize some arguments from his construction of the uh, schwartz christoffel map to simple, uh, <clears throat> sorry, to simple polygons which are no longer bounded by straight lines, but rather by circular arcs, like the one we see over here. Sadly, it failed. However, uh, what Hermann Schwartz did manage to prove was the following idea. Assume we have uh, some polygon bounded by circular arcs with vertices x1 to xn. And let f denote a conformal diffeomorphism from the disk to that uh, polygon. And we will, uh, it, it, we're also assuming it uh, to satisfy some uh, normality condition. Uh, I'm not going to go over it. Again, it is not very relevant to this talk. Then the following expression, which is an expression in the derivatives of that said mapping f, can be described as a function of the vertices. Now, this expression we see over here, uh, which was actually not invented by Hermann Schwartz, is referred to as the Schwartzian derivative, and this would be the focus of this talk. Now, despite it uh, bearing the name of Hermann Schwartz, it was originally discovered by Ernst Kummer when he studied uh, solutions to the hypergeometric equation, which you see over here. Uh, what uh, Ernst Kummer actually did was study how solutions change when you start varying the parameters A, B, C here. Um, I'm not going to go over uh, either one of these arguments. Uh, it is not really relevant uh, to this talk and well, it's basically 19th century complex analysis and we're supposed to be doing 20th century complex analysis. But um, we would need some of the classical properties of the Schwarzian derivative. So the first is that it is well-defined and holomorphic uh, for every locally univalent function. Okay, of course, uh, that is, well, very easy to prove. Just observe that whenever you have a locally univalent function, its first derivative is always non-zero. Now, uh, the second property is that it vanishes identically precisely for the Mobius transformations. That is, the Schwarzian derivative is identically zero if and only if f is a Mobius transformation. So in some sense, the Schwarzian derivative is a conformal invariant, which uh, can tell you whenever a mapping is a Mobius transformation or not. Now, the third property is that it satisfies the following chain rule. Of course, uh, whenever the composition of f with the g uh, you see over here is well, uh, well defined. Now, moving on to some modern mathematics, uh, recall that I've just stated that the Schwartzian derivative is defined for locally injective neuromorphic functions and vanishes identically precisely for the Mobius transformations, which, of course, can be considered as univalent functions of the sphere. Therefore, uh, heuristically, provided a, Schwartz, a given Schwartzian derivative for some locally univalent function, not necessarily defined on the entire sphere, by the way, is somehow small enough, we would expect it to be globally injective on its domain of definition. And why so? Because a small enough Schwartzian derivative would somehow imply that mapping is somehow close to being a Mobius transformation. Now, this is a very heuristic idea. Um, before I move on to present how, well, it was made rigorous, uh, does anyone have any question? No? Okay. Why, why is the uh, 
uh, injectivity uh, uh, an issue? Why is it an issue? Um, what, what, what do you mean by why is it an issue? Why are the, did you talk about it? Why do you talk about it? univalent I like injective information? I don't get it. Why, uh, why do I require a uh, Schwartzian derivative to be defined for locally injective functions? Yes. Oh, uh, the reason is because the first derivative of local injective function is always non zero. And if we go back to the definition, the Schwartzian derivative, then the first derivative is here in the uh, denominator. So otherwise, it may not necessarily be defined. No, okay, so thanks. Okay, cool. So, uh, where is it? So, uh, this heuristic idea about somehow using the Schwarzian derivative to measure how a given uh, mirror-morphic function deviates from being a Mobius transformation uh, was uh, first made precise by Zeb Nihari uh, in 1949. As far as I remember, he actually proved it while working in the Technion. But anyway, that theorem is as follows. Assume we have a holomorphic function in the disk, which is locally injective. Then, provided its Schwarzian derivative satisfies the following inequality throughout the disk, uh, f is also injective. Now, this uh, <clears throat> sorry. Now, this theorem basically tells us that if we have some uh, upper bound in the growth or decay of a given Schwarzian derivative, then we can somehow measure uh, how injective it is, okay? And indeed, that theorem, uh, while it might have, while it might seem like nothing more than curiosity, actually uh, became, well, pretty applicable throughout complex analysis. And the reason is, uh, due to two mathematicians, Lars and Force and Lichtman Burrs, who during the uh, early 50s, um, early 60s, were developing uh, the theory of tight spaces. And both of them soon realized that if that some version of Nihari's uh, theorem could help them embed the tight space of several uh, surfaces, to a complex manifold, which could be more easily described. However, uh, the problem was that the version they needed was a bit more generalized and, it, and they needed uh, something which could be defined uh, more uh, generally. And this leads us to the following definition um, of a... Yes. Could you briefly recall what's the definition or at least how should we think of tight mirror spaces? Uh, I'm afraid uh, not at the moment. Uh, I'm not going to go into the year of tight motor spaces. This was nothing more than an anecdote. Okay. Um, I mean, this is simply, I mean, this is way too involved for this talk. So, um, uh, so <laughs> as I've just said, I'm not going to go into the theory of tight motor spaces. Um, it is, well, a bit too much for today. Um, I will, however, uh, present uh, uh, Alforce's uh, generalization of Nihari's theorem. With, uh, but before we do so, we would need two definitions. Uh, the first is that of a Schwartzian domain. Let D be a hyperbolic domain and denote by raw D the hyperbolic density function in D. Um, before I proceed, uh, do you all know what a hyperbolic domain is? No? Yes? No. Wait, uh, yes, no, or? No. Maybe we should still no, define no. it. Okay. So a hyperbolic domain D is, well, a domain uh, on the sphere in which we can define the hyperbolic geometry. Um, more specifically, uh, any domain on the sphere which omits at least three points is a hyperbolic domain. The hyperbolic density function rod d is the function who, which uh, satisfies the following inequality, such that the hyperbolic metric in d is given by the following, sorry, by the following infimum 
over uh, smooth curves gamma connecting x and y with respect to the following one form, complex one form, of course. Okay? So this is the hyperbolic density function. Again, uh, it is defined for any domain D. So even though uh, it's mean, even though finding a global expression for it may not always be possible. Now, given such a domain, we say it is a Schwarzian domain, provided uh, there is a positive constant alpha, such that any locally injective meromorphic function from D to the Riemann sphere, whose Schwarzian derivative satisfies the following inequality throughout D is injective. Now, obviously, uh, from Nihari's uh, theorem, we know the disk is a Schwarzian domain, and why so? Because this function is the hyperbolic density function for the disk. And in the case for the disk, the constant alpha can be chosen to be two. And this, of course, leads to the question whether there are any non-trivial Schwarzian domains. So uh, the answer is positive. And here below, we have three examples of such domains. We have these two uh, red colored domains here and the, uh, well, Jordan domain enclosed by the Koch snowflake uh, curve. Now, uh, this of course uh, leads us to ask, what's the common ground between these uh, three domains and the disk? And I claim that the common ground here is some self-similarity uh, condition on the boundary. And I guess it, uh, I don't need to convince any of you that the boundary of these uh, three domains is in fact, well, a fractal in the popular uh, sense of the word. And now I also claim the same is true for the circle. And why so? Let us draw a circle and let us choose a small sub arc on it. Then obviously this uh, small sub arc is homeomorphic to any larger sub arc, right? Now, this is of course uh, nothing but a heuristic idea and it cannot be considered a definition for any uh, mathematical idea whatsoever. Therefore, uh, let us now uh, define some self-similarity uh, condition. And that self-similarity condition is uh, the following idea, a quasi-circle. So let gamma be a Jordan curve uh, and choose two points, Z1, Z2, and gamma, and denote by delta the component of gamma minus Z1, Z2, which is of lesser diameter. Then, Gamma is a C quasi circle if there is some positive constant C such that for every choice of Z1, Z2 on gamma, we have for the corresponding delta the following inequality. That is, uh, the diameter of delta is always comparable to the distance between the two endpoints of it in whatever uh, resolution. Okay? So um, here we have uh, two, uh, three uh, Jordan domains. Uh, the, the circle, of course, is a one quasi circle because the diameter of the, well, of this arc is, well, simply given by this distance. With just a little bit more work, it is also possible to show this triangle over here is also a quasi circle. And in fact, it is, it would suffice to prove this condition here only holds around uh, the vertices. Wait, However, uh, what? Uh, yeah. Gamma is a Jordan curve when yes. you think about it sitting inside the, I guess, the boundary of the of the Schwarzian domain, right? So inside the geometry should be hyperbolic. Yes. Yes. So the right. distance between the two points here is not a straight line. No. No. Oh no. 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 Uh, the uh, distance here. Um, no, um, the distance here is, well, the uh, regular Euclidean distance. It's a boundary condition. Okay. I mean, uh, this is not a hyperbolic distance, it's the Euclidean distance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so now we have this uh, third Jordan domain and let us assume for a moment the angle you see here 
uh, is a zero angle. Now, uh, sorry, um, what, uh, um, what would you say? Uh, is this cardioid a Schwarz, um, it was a circle or, sorry, does this curve, this boundary curve define it was a circle or not? Um, what would you suggest? I think not, because if you take two points which are really close uh, to the tip of the heart, uh, I think the, con the, the, the C must be uh, smaller and smaller, so there isn't such C or something like that. Yes, exactly that. Uh, when we take points closer and, um, closer and closer to this cusp over here, C blows up. So, uh, the, uh, so this condition simply cannot hold. So, to continue, uh, we're now ready to uh, state uh, the following characterization of Schwarzian domain. The, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, which is uh, actually while I'm uh, presenting it here as a single theorem, uh, historically it was uh, proven in three separate uh, stages uh, by Lars and Force, Friedrich Gehring, and Fred Oskard. Uh, beginning in 1965 to, I think, 1980. And anyway, it is as follows. A finitely connected domain D is a Schwarzian domain if and only if there is some uh, positive constant C such that every boundary, is, sorry, every boundary component is either a singleton or a sequence a circle. And here indeed we have three uh, examples for Schwarzian domains. Uh, in this case, we have this dark colored region, which is bounded by two circles, one uh, triangle and one rectangle. And obviously, uh, it is a Schwarzian domain as every component here is a quasi circle. And here we have uh, two well, uh, domains which are uh, formally defined as something called a filled in Julia set. I'm not really uh, gonna go deep into the theory of Julia sets or anything like it at this talk, but I would state that it is not trivial to prove that the boundary of these uh, two domains are in fact Jordan domains, uh, sorry, are Jordan curves and they satisfy, well, the quasi-circle condition. So this, uh, this can show that such domains can be in fact uh, very, very complicated. Now, uh, moving on, I guess, uh, before moving on to the more uh, numerical, yes. Hmm? Just a question, finitely connected, finitely connected means that one of the homotopy groups, there's exists an end such that the n homotopy group is zero, right? In the uh, previous slide. No, by n connected, I mean a finite number of boundary uh, components. Uh, okay, not okay. I think that that was maybe a confusion between n connected and finitely connected, right? Um, well, yes. Although, um, yeah, in uh, complex analysis, they often call it finitely connected for some reason. Mm -hmm. So, by finitely connected, I mean a finite number of uh, boundary components. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so um, as I said, um, before moving on to the more uh, dynamically oriented part of this talk, um, let's say a few words about the infinitely uh, connected case. The last theorem, of course, uh, well, is stated only for the uh, n-connected case. And as such, uh, it is worth asking whether it can be generalized to an infinitely connected setting. And the answer is, well, no. Uh, there are counterexamples in the uh, infinitely connected case. However, uh, there are some infinitely connected Schwarzian domains, like the one we see over here. What we have over here is, well, a counter set, a planar counter set. And it turns out that when we puncture the sphere precisely at the points of this counter set, then the resulting domain is a Schwarzian domain, even though there is no quasi-circle on its boundary. So 
Having uh, said that, let's move on to the uh, second part of this talk about the applications of the Schwarzian derivative in dynamics. So, the uh, somewhere around the uh, late. Uh, wait, Ryan, can I uh, stop yes. for a second? Yes. So, um, I'm not sure. Maybe this is a question to the end of the talk, uh, but it seems uh, fitting because you're moving to a different topic. Anyway, my question is, so. The, the what we did so far can it be used to construct an explicit formula for a Riemann map, Riemann mapping or uh, no no uh, it has no uh, connection to it in fact um, the attempts as far as I know uh, the attempts to construct Riemann mappings with the Schwarzian derivatives uh, pretty much well failed. Um, the original scheme, as far as I remember, was to um, hopefully construct a Riemann mapping between uh, the disk and uh, a polygon bounded by circular arcs, and then to begin approximating uh, generally simply connected domains by, uh, well, such polygons. But as the construction for the uh, general polygon failed, then uh, this failed as well. Okay, so let's move on to uh, dynamics. Uh, in uh, the late 70s, uh, a mathematician uh, called David Zinger observed how the Schwarzian derivative can be applied to analyze the dynamics of some interval maps, more specifically, unimodal maps. What are unimodal maps? Unimodal maps are uh, functions defined on the unit interval, which are differentiable, uh, which uh, will uh, fix zero and, well, they don't fix zero and one, but uh, they have the same value at the boundary and admit precisely one critical point at the open interval. That is a unimodal uh, function is a function whose graph looks roughly like this. And we may, of course, consider them as a generalization of quadratic polynomials, right? After all, the graph of some polynomials, like the following logistic map you see over here, can be uh, described roughly like this. Now, obviously, given a unimodal function, which is at least C3 with a non-vanishing first derivative, it is possible to define a Schwarzian derivative for it away from the critical point, right? So um, before I continue, I would like to give just a very, very brief introduction to dynamics, just so what I'm saying won't be lost on you, okay? So um, in interval dynamics, we're often interested in studying the orbits of points X in the interval. And by an orbit, I mean the set of X and all its iterates with the notation F n denoting the composition of F with itself n times. Now, uh, of course, uh, we often have fixed points uh, which are interesting uh, in dynamics and, uh, <coughs> sorry, and periodic points. What are periodic points? We say a uh, given point P is periodic provided uh, there is some minimal natural number n, which is of course greater than one, such that uh, the nth iterate of p equals p. And in that case, we say the orbit or uh, is well a period or a cycle of length n. Now, why are we interested uh, in uh, the fixed points and uh, periodic points? Because quite often, the dynamics of well, unimodal functions tend to be uh, organized around them. And why so? Let's, uh, with some uh, well, abuse of notation and for simplicity, assume our fixed point is zero. And let us denote by uh, gamma the multiplier at zero, that is the first derivative. Then around zero, sorry, uh, the function can be described roughly as the following linear map. And its iterates, therefore, can be roughly described as this 
linear map. And therefore, when uh, gamma, when its absolute value is lesser than one, we would expect the iterates to converge to zero in that case, right? And when it is greater than one, we would expect them to be uh, repelled away from zero. Now, this leads us to the uh, following definitions of attracting and repelling fixed points, depending on the uh, size of the multiplier. Provided it is lesser than one, it's the fixed point is attracting. If it is greater than one, it is repelling. And if it, uh, if it is equal to one, it is indifferent. Now, and obviously uh, this definition can be extended uh, to cycles when we simply take the nth iterate of f and observe the multiplier there. Now, it is a non-trivial fact that when we have an attracting or a repelling fixed point, there exists some uh, maximal subinterval, open interval in the uh, unit interval, such that for points in that subinterval, uh, their iterates either converge to P when the fixed point is attracting or repelled uh, away from P when it is repelling. Okay, so uh, this linear approximation we've just done actually uh, carries some substance into it. Now, um, before I proceed, I would just like to say about indifferent points that uh, the name here is a bit misleading. Uh, despite the name, uh, the dynamics around indifferent points can be extremely complicated in some cases. Uh, even chaotic. So uh, the name indifferent does not apply in different dynamics. So um, before moving on, let's observe these two schemes. We have here an attracting scheme and a repelling scheme, just to observe how uh, this iteration of points and uh, which converge or are repelled from fixed points uh, actually look like. So here we have our point x0, okay, which we will soon begin to iterate. And we have the fixed point somewhere over here. How do I know it is a fixed point? It is the point of intersection between the graph and the straight line y equals x. Okay, so let's begin iterating it. Uh, this is its value um, by f. And we understand by iterating that this point is the corresponding uh, Sorry, this is where uh, f takes x0 on the real line. Uh, continuing uh, in this way, we continue uh, to iterate uh, x0. Here we have the second iterate of x0. And we soon find out how the iterates all converge to the fixed point. So this is an attracting uh, scheme. Here, on the other hand, we have the opposite case. Here we begin iterating x0. And well, we soon find out how its iterates are simply repelled away from the fixed point. OK, so this is a repelling uh, scheme. So moving on, uh, we can begin uh, describing the applications of the Schwarzian derivative to uh, unimodal dynamics. So. To begin, a unimodal uh, function f satisfies the negative Schwarzian condition, provided its uh, Schwarzian derivative is negative throughout the interval. From the uh, Schwarzian chain rule, uh, we know that the first, uh, sorry, that if this uh, Schwarzian derivative is negative, then the same would be true for the Schwarzian derivative of an e-trade. Now, uh, um, yes. Again, you mean throughout the interval, except for the critical point, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is one point I should go over. Uh, by a negative Schwarzian condition, I mean that the critical point can be considered as a removable singularity, or simply away from the uh, from the critical point. Okay. So, Wait, but if uh, if you want to replace the singularity, uh, but keep the condition that uh, f of zero equals f of one, then Rawls theorem tells you that uh, you will always have some critical point, right? 
Yes, but the Schwarzian derivative will may not necessarily satisfy. Well, um, let me write it down here. This condition, if it is even defined, and I mean, it may not even be defined at the uh, at the boundary. I mean, this is after all an expression in the uh, first, second, and third derivative. I just f. mean that uh, you had a, you had two conditions on f, right? That uh... Its values on zero and one agree, and that it has one yeah. critical point. Yes. And so, if yes. you want to remove the critical point, I mean, what I'm saying is, you can completely remove the critical point. F must oh, have a critical no. point somewhere. No, I'm I'm not removing the critical point for F. I'm removing it for the Schwarzian derivative as a function. The critical point of F is a singularity for the Schwarzian derivative. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, we have uh, three facts. I think I'm going to prove only uh, fact two among them. But anyway, uh, the first fact is well, the simplest one, and I'm not going to prove it. It's uh, well, it's simply a matter of equating the signs of different coefficients. Assuming the negative Schwarzian condition. The first derivative of f may admit either local uh, negative minima or local positive maxima. That is, the Schwarzian, uh, the sorry, the, deri the first derivative of a function of a unimodal function with a negative Schwarzian derivative looks something like that. It cannot uh, look like this, for example. Okay, so. Uh, let's now move on to uh, fact two, which states as follows. For any uh, natural number n, f may admit at most a finite number of cycles with length n. So before I give the uh, very, very short proof of this fact, uh, why is it interesting? So uh, to see that, first, uh, assume for a moment we have a polynomial of well, of some degree, it doesn't really matter which. And note that, well, actually recall that, uh, sorry, that this equation has at most a finite number of solutions for any polynomial P, right? And this basically tells us that for polynomial dynamics, uh, there may be at most a finite number of cycles with length N. What fact two basically does is generalize this very, very simple fact from polynomial dynamics to, well, non-polynomial dynamics and dynamics which may, in fact, not necessarily even be uh, inf infinitely differentiable. So um, this is, uh, well, an ongoing theme in one-dimensional uh, dynamics when we uh, often try to generalize ideas uh, from holomorphic uh, or uh, infinitely uh, differentiable dynamics to, uh, well, not necessarily infinitely differentiable case. So uh, to begin the proof of fact two, let us set uh, G as the nth iterate of F and note how if there are infinitely uh, many points uh, satisfying this equation, then obviously this function would vanish infinitely many times. Therefore, there are infinitely many solutions to this equation as well. However, uh, S uh, G prime cannot have any positive minima due to the negative Schwarzian condition. It must vanish infinitely often, which of course is a contradiction as it must have at most a finite number of critical values. Okay. So this was a very uh, short proof for, well, uh, a fact which we hope uh, is trivial. But anyway, uh, let's uh, just um, state this fact and then move on to prove uh, Zinger's theorem. Uh, just one question, how much uh, time do I have? You have 25 more minutes. Wow, okay. So, okay, so this is fast, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, to begin, uh, what fact three basically states that if A, B, and C are three consecutive fixed points in the unique interval, 
for some uh, n iterate of g. And assuming the subinterval between a and c contains no critical points, then the multiplier of b is greater than one, that is, it is a repelling fixed point. And you know what? If we have more time than I thought we would, let's uh, give, well, uh, the proof here, it is very, very short. And it goes as follows. Um, as before, note that uh, this function admits three uh, zeros in this uh, subinterval between AC. Therefore, uh, this uh, equation has two solutions, uh, u and v, which are, of course, uh, well, uh, satisfying this equality, right? <clears throat> now, um, any maxima for g prime must be positive again due to the negative uh, Schwarzian condition and fact one. And therefore, we know the multiplier has to be greater than one. So this basically proves fact three. Now, fact three can be used to prove the following uh, theorem by uh, David Zinger. And this theorem actually generalizes a very, very deep result in polynomial dynamics. Uh, but before uh, stating uh, what it actually generalizes, uh, <coughs> sorry, what it actually generalizes, uh, let's uh, go over the proof. So assume we have the unimodal function with a negative Schwarzian derivative. Then if there exists an attracting cycle for f, there is a critical point attracted to it. As such, there exists at most one attracting cycle. So uh, the proof goes as follows. Assume uh, P is an attracting uh, fixed point for a G, which is some iterate of F and denote by RS the maximal subinterval such that P belongs in RS and all the eventual uh, iterates of points in RS under G are attracted to P. Now, if there is no critical point in RS, there are three distinct possibilities we must consider. So the first is that G fixes the boundary. Since P is attracting, of course, uh, this we have a contradiction due to fact three. Uh, the second is that G switches between the two points in the boundary. However, uh, applying fact three to G2 again uh, yields a contradiction. The uh, last remaining uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, possibility is that GR equals GS. However, in this case, Rawls theorem would also tell us we have a contradiction. So all in all, we conclude that we must have a critical point in RS and the uh, proof is complete. Although um, I would just like to state briefly before uh, moving on that sorry, um, that uh, option three here can actually be described uh, as follows. Here we have the uh, graph of our uh, unimodal function. Okay, and we have our fixed point uh, somewhere around here. And here we have R and S. And therefore from Rolle's uh, theorem, we must have a, a critical point here. Now, as I said earlier, uh, this theorem generalizes uh, well, a result from polynomial dynamics. And that result is that an attractive- it's Sorry, Ron. So well, in this yeah. example, in this example, P is, uh, is attracted to uh, S, is that- uh, No. Um, what's no, happening uh, here? What, wait, uh, what are you asking about the uh, interval RS? No, I, I'm asking, so the theorem tells us that there is a critical point. Oh yeah, I meant not P, I meant the critical point we found is attracted to what it should attract to, uh, oh, it attracts Attract, to P? It attracts to P. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this uh, theorem generalizes a result by Pierre Fatou and Gaston Julia from 1920 for polynomial dynamics. What uh, they proved was that uh, the, that for a given polynomial of any degree, the attracting cycles uh, always attract 
a critical point. That is, every attracting cycle attracts at least one critical point. <coughs> Sorry. And therefore, we, uh, uh, their theorem uh, allows us to give an upper bound on the number of attracting cycles. And what, they, what Zinger's uh, theorem basically does is generalize the, res uh, the, uh, the result to a unimodal setting. And there had been, if I'm not mistaken, also uh, some uh, generalizations of uh, Zinger's result to um, multi-model functions, which uh, if the unimodal function is uh, the, uh, ge the generalization of a quadratic polynomial, then a bimodal, for example, is a generalization of a cubic polynomial and so on. So what uh, Zinger's theorem basically tells us that a negative Schwarzian condition in some way uh, implies that the dynamics for uh, the function is almost like that of a holomorphic function or almost like that of a polynomial to be precise. Now, um, this of course uh, is not the end of it. There are, uh, now while uh, this uh, negative Schwarzian condition may seem like a one hit theorem, in fact, uh, there are many, many, many applications of the negative Schwarzian uh, condition in uh, one dimensional dynamics. One uh, more recent result, I think uh, due to Alexander Koslowski, uh, states that if there is a negative Schwarzian condition coupled with uh, another uh, condition, which I'm not going to go over, then uh, almost every point in the interval is attracted to, well, some attracting cycle. Or uh, in his notation, the Lyapunov exponent is almost everywhere negative. But anyway, uh, that's uh, beyond the scope here. And well, I'm pretty much uh, done. So this is it. Are there any questions? Thanks. Actually, yeah, I have uh, a few questions. Yes. So, um, yeah, first of all, uh, in, in dynamics, uh, I'm wondering, uh, why do we care that a critical point is attracted to a cycle? Uh, what's the dynamical significance oh. of it? That depends on the function, but in general, the reason we care about it, for example, for polynomials, is because it allows us to give uh, an upper uh, bound on the number of attracting cycles. That is, if the polynomial is, say, of degree uh, four, then there may be at most three attracting cycles. So that's why you were interested in it. And in the unimodal case or multimodal case, you also have a finite number of critical points. So if we know uh, every attracting cycle attracts a critical point, you can give, again, an upper bound in the number of attracting cycles. Great, thanks. And a couple more questions. So, yeah. uh, so previously we looked at uh, the Schwarzian derivative and we, uh, we thought about a uh, small Sch Schwarzian derivative in some sense. Yes. And here we are only interested in negative uh, Schwarzian derivative and don't care about its uh, magnitude somehow. So maybe is there uh, some usage of small but positive shorts and derivative or something of that kind? Um, that depends. I mean, um, well, in the beginning, we considered the Schwarz and derivative as a univalence marker, if you like. Uh, it basically tells us how much a given holomorphic function or meromorphic function, to be precise, uh, deviates from being univalent, or more precisely, deviates from being a Mobius transformation. Here, uh, this idea is, well, less apparent, although it is possible uh, to define a concept called the uh, nonlinearity measure for interval functions, which allows you to measure how much they deviate from being a linear interval function, which you can think of somehow corresponding to that idea from complex analysis. Interesting. So one last question. I'm sorry for hijacking the question no, session. Feel free. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering, so 
for the dynamical uh, section, we were looking at uh, only one dimensional dynamics. And I wonder yes. can this uh, Schwartz and derivative thing can be used at least for complex uh, uh, dynamics or maybe higher uh, dimensional. Uh, um, well, I don't know to, I, I don't really know. I, as far as I recall, there are some applications for uh, holomorphic dynamics. Um, which actually depend on Schwarzian derivatives, with, which looks like polynomial. Although I'm not quite sure how and where they're being applied. Um, although uh, I, I have a paper which uh, gives a rough, uh, well, it does give a, a rough review of the history and applications of the Schwarzian derivative although without the dynamical part, it is more uh, geometry and tecular uh, theory oriented. I could send it to you if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, uh, okay no so problem. let's give a round of applause to Iran. Thank you very much for opening the semester with the what is. Everyone can unmute and clap. <laughs> Thank you, Iran. Thank you. Uh, thanks, welcome. Um, just before uh, I go, one more thing, uh, you all are free to log out if you wish, but uh, there is a reading seminar uh, organized this semester on one dimensional dynamics, if you're interested. Okay, so um, uh, earlier on, I, uh, I introduced the logistic family and the logistic family is the following uh, family of quadratic polynomial, which is indexed continuously with respect to parameter between one and four. Now, um, as it is indexed continuously in one parameter, we will refer to it as a one parameter family. Now, um, it is a fact that for an interval of parameters, there is an attracting fixed point. In fact, uh, that uh, interval is precisely the open uh, subinterval between three and one. Now, when mu equals three, the attracting fixed point becomes indifferent and for mu greater than three, the fixed point suddenly splits in two and becomes an attracting cycle of length two. That is, uh, we have a period doubling bifurcation at mu equals three, where an attracting uh, period of order one is split in two to an, uh, to an attracting period of 